Derukui wa utareru, the post that sticks out gets hammered down, is a common Japanese proverb that warns against the dangers of standing out. This week on Lost in Translation, we explore what games like Final Fantasy and The Legend of Zelda teach us about Japanese community spirit and collectivism. Pickle. Huge crowds of people pushing through subway stations and busy sidewalks is an image that many Westerners associate with Japan. Where I live now, I have to deal with such crowds rarely, but for a majority of Japanese, this is a daily reality. Video games are rarely capable of simulating such complicated crowds. Traditional villages in video games tend to have a population of what, like 12 people? But what they can do is recreate the culture that tends to crop up in such environments. Living in close quarters has many side effects, one of which is the necessity for close cooperation. There's such a high degree of trust in the community that even in Tokyo, parents feel comfortable sending their six-year-old children on errands across town. There's actually an entire show in Japan based on this concept, Hajimete no Otsukai, or My First Errand, where they follow young children running, you guessed it, their first errand. While big cities seem to correlate with greater collectivism, Studies have actually shown that Japanese who move to more rural areas exhibit a higher degree of individualism. Even so, rural Japanese have been known for their strong community spirit. In the village of Shirakawago, the entire community comes together when a neighbor's roof needs to be thatched, an overwhelming task made simple through coordinated group effort. This sense of community is often referred to as murashakai, or village society a phrase that Japanese love to use to describe their way of life. If you were to visit the beaches of Tokyo in the first week of September, you would find them to be nearly empty, not because of poor weather necessarily, but because the lifeguard stations close for the season at the end of August. It's not that the beaches are actually closed either, as they're still open to the public, but the Japanese raise their children to never swim when there isn't a lifeguard present, and amazingly enough, even into adulthood, they stick hard and fast to this rule. To find someone who would willingly disobey this informal rule is rare, even on a hot September day. Strict respect for the rules and standards set forth by the community is a hallmark of collectivism. So, just what is collectivism and how does it relate to individualism? Collectivism is a basic element of culture that favors the importance of the group over the needs of the individual. Generosity, kindness, and duty are highly valued. Individualism, on the other hand, favors individual freedom and the worth of the individual. Individualism values personal goals of achievement, individual success, and self-reliance. The two are often viewed as extremes on a single continuum, but this isn't quite accurate. Individualism and collectivism are separate scales that are independent of each other. It is possible to rank very highly on both individualism and collectivism. Though highly controversial, entire societies can be measured on what is known as the INDCOL scale. Eastern Asian countries as a whole tend to rank very highly on collectivism and low on individualism, while Western nations tend to represent the inverse. Japan as a nation is a bit unique, however, in that the adult workforce ranks very high on collectivism, but college students tend to rank low on both collectivism and individualism. So if you're wondering where you would personally fall on the INDCOL scales, I've included a link to a short test in the description below. I suggest you head there after the video and just take the test for yourself. It's really short, so you should check it out. So, this Japanese collectivism penetrates every level of society, including business structure. Japanese companies can be defined as paternalist, meaning the company relates to its employees the same way a parent relates to their children. The company is a family in a very real sense. This has a whole string of unique side effects. Until more recently, companies wouldn't fire employees for anything other than egregious offenses. In a sense, you're employed for life. This reinforces a sense of togetherness. Coworkers are incentivized to get along, as they will likely be working partners for most of their lives. It is important to understand that along with collectivism and individualism, there are what are known as vertical and horizontal societies as well. A vertical society is very hierarchy-oriented with a definite power structure, while people in horizontal societies tend to view everyone as their equal, 
with status being of lesser importance. Japan, Korea, and the United States are all vertical societies, while Denmark, Sweden, and the Netherlands are more horizontal societies. Vertical collectivist nations, of which Japan is one, put a huge focus on the importance of family and the rigid hierarchy of the family line. It is my duty to take care of my family even when I have to sacrifice what I want, is a sentiment a vertical collectivist such as the Japanese would be likely to agree with. Family duty is also a theme explored in many Japanese video games. Final Fantasy VII is, in many ways, a game about people who have no family who come together to form a hybrid family. While family is important to everyone, it is particularly significant to the Japanese. Three generational homes are not uncommon, with grandparents, parents, and children all living under the same roof. So, how does collectivism manifest itself in the world of video games? Let's use the Legend of Zelda series as a point of contrast with The Elder Scrolls or even Mass Effect. In the Legend of Zelda games, you often play as a character charged with saving the world by defeating a great evil power. The pattern each game follows is one of gathering strength through the help of sages. Without the sages, Link cannot face the final enemy. To contrast, in the Elder Scrolls games, you fight enemies to make yourself stronger. In Zelda games, you defeat enemies to gather support from the sages to help you defeat the ultimate enemy because Link on his own isn't strong enough. The sages tend to come from all walks of life and contribute evenly to Link's progress towards his goal. The player cannot make decisions that significantly alter the plot, and you cannot create your own customized character to play as within the game. In both the Elder Scrolls series and Mass Effect, you create your own custom character that is unique to you, and proceed to make decisions that further customize who your character is and what their personality is like. It is a very individualist concept to want to play the same game as everyone else, but in your own distinctly personal way. None of this is to say that all games fall under these styles, but that the cultural influence in Japan has made collectivism and cooperative effort an emphasis. While not as successful as Nintendo would have liked, the 3DS Street Pass system is an excellent reflection of collectivism. The system requires the help of strangers in your local physical community to help you progress in your game. The idea here is that the people around you hold the key to your personal progress and that there is simply no way to go it alone. Admittedly, Street Pass works best if you ride on crowded public transportation on a frequent basis, something that can't be said for most of the United States, but works perfectly in the train systems of Japan. Similar to Street Pass, two of the most popular mobile games in Japan, Puzzle and Dragons and Monster Strike, have implemented a system that puts you at the mercy of the community. For those not familiar, before you enter a dungeon, you are required to select a friend's monster to assist your party. If you do not have any friends, they will suggest some for you, but you gain twice as many points if you select someone you have previously befriended. Likewise, you get to choose which monsters of yours are designated to help your friends, meaning if you have a particular stroke of luck or develop a strong creature, your friends stand to benefit as well. This fosters a sense of community spirit, but also a peculiar level of duty. Friends can only use your monster once until you log back in, meaning this system brings people back again and again as they seek to maximize their impact in the community. It's both ingenious and maddening, but more than anything, it resonates with the Japanese target audience, who have become more and more captivated by mobile gaming each year. One final point of comparison is within the JRPG party system. In a well-balanced game, the party system reflects the value of the group over the individual. No single character can pull it out on their own, and moving support characters to the back row or otherwise protecting them reflects a sense of duty often seen in Japanese culture. An individual will often tolerate less desirable circumstances if it means furthering the cause of the group. Alternatively, in games such as Chrono Trigger, your most powerful attacks are always collaborative, with each character in your party contributing in harmony with the others. RPGs can help people understand group dynamics and the value of cooperation better than most other genres. Japan is a fascinating and ever-changing country. There's just so much to talk about here, so we will definitely be revisiting this topic in a later video. Let me know what you think and anything I failed to cover. I have pages of notes that I didn't include in this video, so I may end up posting those if you're interested. But for now, the next time you dive into battle in a party-based RPG, 
Take a moment to reflect on the meaning of murashakai, that Japanese sense of belonging, duty, and community spirit. I'll see you again next time.